difficult experiments. In 1912, Jung had some significant dreams that he did not understand. He gave particular importance to two of these, which he felt showed the limitations of Freud's conception of dreams. The first, I was in a southern town on a rising street with narrow half landings. It was 12 o'clock midday, bright sunshine, and old Austrian custom guards or someone similar passes by me. Lost in thought, someone says, that is one who cannot die. He died already 30, 40 years ago, but has not yet managed to decompose. I was very surprised. Here a striking figure came, a knight of powerful build, clad in yellowish armor. His looks solid, he looks solid and inscrutable and nothing impresses him. On his back he carried a red Maltese cross. He has continued to exist from the 12th century and daily between 12 and 1 o'clock in the day he takes the same route. No one marvels at these two apparitions, but I was extremely surprised. I, held, I hold back my interpretive skills as regards the old Austrian. Freud occurred to me as regards the night I myself. Jung found the dream oppressing and bewildering, and Freud was unable to interpret it. The second came half a year later. I dreamed then that I was sitting with my children in a marvelous and richly furnished tower chamber. An open columned hall, we were sitting at a round table whose top was a marvelous dark green stone. Suddenly, a seagull or dove flew in and landed elatedly on the table. I admonished the children to be quiet so that they would not scare away the beautiful white bird. Suddenly, this little bird turned into a child of eight years a small blonde girl and ran around playing with my children in a marvelous columned colonnades in the marvelous columned colonnades then the child suddenly turned into the gull or dove she said the following to me only in the first hour of the night can I become human while the male dove is busy with the twelve dead with these words, the birds flew away and I awoke. In 1925, Jung remarked that this dream was the beginning of a conviction that the unconscious did not consist of inert material only, but that there was something living down there. He added that he thought of the story of Tabula Samargardina. Smaragdina, the Twelve Apostles, the signs of the Zodiac, and so on. But he could make nothing out of the dream except that there was a tremendous animation of the unconscious. I knew no technique of getting at the bottom of this activity. All I could do was just wait, keep on living, and watch the fantasies. These dreams led him to analyze his childhood memories. While he was engaged in the self-analytic activity, he continued to develop his theoretical work at the Munich Psychoanalytical Congress on September 8th and 7th of 1913. He spoke on the psychological types. He argued that there were two basic movements, movements of the libido, extroversion, in which the subject's interest was orientated towards the outer world, and introversion, in which the subject's interest was directed towards himself. Following from this, he posited two types of people characterized by the predominance of one of these tendencies. The psychologies of Freud and Alfred Adler were examples of the fact that psychologists often took what was true of their type as generally valid, hence what was required was a psychology that did justice to both of these types. The following month, on a train journey to Schaffenhausen, Schaffhausen, passing by the Rhine Falls and close to where we, he spent his early years, Jung experienced the waking vision of Europe being devastated by a catastrophic flood. 
which was repeated two weeks later on the same journey. As he later recounted in Lever Novice, I saw a terrible flood that covered all of the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. It reached from England up to Russia, and from the coast of the North Sea right up to the Alps. I saw yellow waves swim in rubble and the death of countless thousands. After the second occasion, he heard an inner voice say, Look at it. It is completely real, and it will come to pass. He cannot doubt this. In 1925, he described the event as follows. I was traveling by train and took and had a book in my hand that I was reading. I began to fantasize and before I knew it, I was in the town to which I was going. This was the fantasy. I was looking down on the map of Europe in relief. I saw all the northern part in English sinking down to that so that the sea came up so that the sea came in upon it. I came up to Switzerland, and then I saw that the mountains grew higher and higher to protect Switzerland. I realized that a frightful catastrophe was in progress. Towns and people were destroyed, and the wrecks and the dead bodies were tossing about on the water. Then the sea turned to blood. At first, I was only looking dispassionately and then the sense of the catastrophe gripped me with the, with tremendous power commenting on this he remarked I could be taken to Switzerland fenced in by mountains and the submergence of the world could be the debris of my former relationships this led him to the following diagnosis of his condition I thought to myself if this means anything it means that I am hopelessly off I had the feeling that I was in overcompensated psychosis, and from this feeling, I was not released till August 1st of 1914. After this experience, Jung feared that he would go mad. He recalled that he first thought that the images of the vision indicated a revolution, but as he could not imagine this, he concluded that he was threatened by a psychosis. After this, he had a similar vision. In the winter, I stood, I once stood at the window, deep in the night, and looked north. There I saw a blood red glow stretched from east to west over the northern horizon, like the flicker of the sea, seen from afar. And someone asked me at that time, what I thought about the future of the world. I told him that I hadn't thought, but I saw blood, streams of blood. In the years directly preceding the outbreak of the war, apocalyptic imagery was widespread in European art and literature. For example, in 1912, the Russian painter Walisky Kand Walsily Kandinsky Wassily Kandinsky wrote of a coming universal catastrophe. From 1912 and 1914, Ludwig Maeder painted a series of works known as the Apocalyptic Landscapes, with scenes of destroyed cities, corpses, and turmoil. Prophecy was in the air. In 1899, the famous American medium Leonora Piper predicted that in the coming century there would be a terrible war in different parts of the world that would cleanse the world and reveal the truths of spiritualism. In 1918, Arthur Conan Doyle, the spiritualist and author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, viewed this as having been prophetic. In Jung's account of the fantasy on the train of in Lieber Novice, on, in Jung's account of the fantasy on the train in, in Lieva Novice, the inner voice said that what the fantasy depicted would become completely real. It seems probable that what took place was a hypnagogic vision. That is, he entered into a stream of imagery in a state of drowsiness while reading a book. Initially, he interpreted this subjectively and prospectively. 
as depicting the imminent destruction of his world. His reaction to the experience was to undertake a psychological investigation of himself. In this epoch, self-experimentation was used in medicine and psychology. Introspection had been one of the main tools of his psychological research. Chung came to realize that transformations and symbols of the libido could be taken as myself and that an analysis of it leads inevitably to an analysis of my own unconscious processes. He had projected his material onto the fantasies of an American woman he had never met, <coughs> Miss Frank Miller. Up to this point, Jung had been an active thinker and had been averse to fantasy. As a form of thinking, I held it to be altogether impure, a sort of incestuous intercourse, thoroughly immoral from an intellectual viewpoint. He now turned to analyze his fantasies, carefully noting everything, and had to overcome considerable resistance in doing this. Admitting fantasy in myself had the same effect as would be produced on a man if he came into his workshop and found all the tools lying about doing things independently of his will. In studying fantasies, Jung realized that he was studying the myth-creating function of the mind. I recall that until 1900 I had kept a diary and I thought that this would be a possibility for me to try to observe myself. This would be an attempt to meditate on myself and I began to describe my inner states. These represented themselves to me in a literary metaphor. For example, I was in a desert and the sun shone unbearably. Sun equals consciousness. His first move was to, an, to attempt to find a majestic correlate, correlates to his um, emotional states. He picked up his brown notebook, which he had set aside in 1902 and began writing in it. He recalled that in his childhood, he used to like to build houses and structures, and he took this up again to reconnect with that time. He built a church with the red pyramidal stone as the altar and gathering stones from the lake shore at the bottom of his garden. It reminded him, this reminded him of his childhood dreams of the underground phallus. He would usually do this after lunch and also sometimes in the evening. It clarified his thoughts and led him to know his fantasies, which he then recorded in the black books. He had the feeling that he was practicing a rite, as in mythology. Regarding his writing, he recalled in 1925, for the sake then of trying to achieve the maximum honesty with myself, I wrote everything down very carefully following the old Greek mandate, give away all thou possesses and thou shalt receive. This was from the Metheric liturgy. It occurred to John that he could write down his reflections in a sequence. He was writing autobiographical material, but not as an autobiography. From the time of the Platonic dialogues onward, the dialogical Form had been a major theme, a major genre in Western philosophy. St. Augustine wrote his soliloquies, which presented an extended dialogue between himself and reason, who instructs him. The work begins with the following lines, and I had been pondering many different things to myself for a long time, and had for many days been seeking my own self and what my own good was, and what evil was to be avoided, then suddenly spoke to me. What was it? I myself or someone else, inside or outside me. This is the very thing I would love to know, but don't. While writing book two, he posed, he posed the question. I said to myself, what is this I am doing? It certainly is not science. What is it? Then a voice said to me, this is art. This made the strangest sort of impression upon me. Because it was not in any sense my impression that what I was writing was art. Then I came to this. Perhaps my unconscious is forming a personality. 
that is not I, but which is insisting on coming through to expression. I don't know why exactly, but I know to a certainty that the voice that the voice that had said my writing was art had come from a woman. Well, I said very emphatically to this voice that what I was doing was not art, and I felt a great resistance grow up within me. No voice came through, however, and I kept on writing. This time I caught her and said, no, it is not. And I felt as though an argument would ensue. He thought that the voice was the soul of the primitive sense in the primitive sense, which he called the anima, the Latin word for soul. In putting down all this material for analysis, I was in effect writing letters to my anima. That is part of myself with a different viewpoint from my own. I got remarks of a new character. I was in analysis with a ghost and a woman. In retrospect, he recalled that this was the voice of a Dutch patient he had known from 1912 to 1918, who had persuaded a psychiatrist colleague that the latter was a misunderstood artist. The woman had thought that the unconscious was art, but Jung had maintained that it was nature. I previously argued that the woman in question was Maria Molzer, and that the psychiatrist in question was Jung's friend and colleague, Franz Ricklin, who increasingly forsook, forsook, forsook analysis for painting. In 1913, he became a student of Augusto Giacometti, the uncle of Alberto Giacometti and an important early abstract painter in his own right. This first sequence from 19, from November to December of 1913 could be characterized as the search for a method. It depicts Jung turning towards his soul and undertaking a reconsideration of his life, a transvaluation of values. Up to this point, he had been successful and had achieved all that, had, that he had sought. Then came the vision on the way to Schoffenhausen, to Schaffhausen, which provoked him to return to his soul. He considered himself an anchorite in his own desert, trying to find visual metaphors to contain and express his experience. He experienced doubt and confusion. There was no movement until December 11th, so he had been addressing his soul for a month before receiving a reply. A dialogue now developed. The soul told him that she was not his mother. He should be patient. The way the truth was to those without intentions. And he needed to realize that intentions limit life. He addressed his feelings of self-scorn. His soul told him that this was out of the question. Scorn was only an issue if he was completely vain. She asked if he knew who she was. He had made her into a dead formula? Had he made her into a dead formula? On December 12th, as he recounted in his 1925 seminar, not knowing what could come next, I thought more introspection was needed. When we introspect, we look within and see if there's anything to be observed. And if there is nothing, we may either give up the introspective process or find a way of boring through to the material that escapes the first survey. I devised such a boring method by fantasizing that I was digging a hole and by accepting this fantasy as perfectly real. Young had probably actually started by physically digging holes in his garden down by the water to release his fantasies. He then began to imagine doing the same while seated in his library. He descended into the depths and a fantasy sequence unfolded. His eye found himself in a dark cave. He saw a red stone which he tried to reach through muddy water. The stone covered an opening in the rock, 
He placed his ear to the opening and heard a screaming and saw a person who had been killed float past, as well as a black scarab. A red sun shone at the bottom of the stream, and there were serpents on the wall, which crawled toward the sun and eventually covered it. Blood sprang forth and then subsided. This was a striking, horrific image. During what unfolded, he was involved passively as a spectator. This process shifted in December 21st. He encountered the figures of Elijah, the blind Salome, and a serpent. Jung's eye looked into a stone and saw it saw in an eve, followed by Odysseus on his journeys. Elijah told Jung's eye that Salome was his daughter and that they had and that they had been companions since eternity. Salome told Jung's eye that she loved him. Elijah told him that Salome loved the prophet and announced the new God to the world. Jung's eye was shocked at all of this. He heard wild music. He wondered if Salome loved him because he had murdered the hero. He had further encounters with Elijah and Salome on December 22nd and the 25th. These critical fantasies signaled a breakthrough from passive witnessing to active engagement. He had broken through a barrier. A method had been found and consolidated. Trusting to his soul's vision, he entered into an exchange with the figures, listened to them, and allowed himself to be instructed. This became his via vid regia to the imaginal world. The fantasies in the black books may be understood as a type of dramatized thinking in pictorial form. As one reads them, the impact of Jung's mythological studies becomes clear. Some of the figures and conceptions derive directly from his readings. The form and the style of his fantasies bear witness to his fascination with the world of myths and epic. In these entries, Jung was both a participant and a scribe of his interior imaginal dramas, bearing witness to what he encountered. The first phase of his undertaking may be characterized as a religious quest an effort to recover a sense of meaning in his life. In December 1913, he referred to this first black book as the book of my most difficult experiments. In retrospect, he recalled, my scientific question went, what would happen if I switched off consciousness? I noticed from dreams that something stood in the background and I wanted to give this a fair chance to come forward. One submits to the, to the necessary conditions, as in a mescaline experiment, so that it emerges. In a later entry in his dream book, on April 17th of 1917, he noted, Since then, frequent exercises in the emptying of consciousness. The st these statements indicated that his interest was in studying what emerged when one emptied consciousness and allowed whatever was in the background to emerge. His procedure was clearly intentional. While its aim was to allow psychic content to spontaneously emerge, he recalled, sometimes it was as if I heard with ears. Sometimes I felt, felt it in the mouth as if my tongue formulated words and then it came that I heard myself whisper a word to myself under the threshold of consciousness everything was living Jung had had extensive experience studying mediums and trance states during which they were encountered to produce waking fantasies and visual hallucinations and he had conducted experiments with automatic writing practices of visualization had also been used in various religious traditions. For example, St. Ignatius of Loyola's fifth spiritual exercise instructs in individuals to see with the eyes of the imagination the length, breadth, and depth of hell, and to experience this with full sensory immediacy. 
Emanuel Swedenborg engaged in spirit writing. An entry in his spiritual diary reads, January 8th, 1748. Spirits, if permitted, could possess those who speak with them so utterly that they would be as though they were entirely in the world, and indeed in a manner so manifest that they could communicate their thoughts through their medium and even by letters. For they have sometimes and indeed often directed my hand when writing as though it were quite their own so that they thought it was not I but themselves writing. From 1909 onward in Vienna the psychoanalyst Herbert Silber Silberer conducted experiments on himself in hypnagogic states. Silberer attempted to allow images to appear. These images he maintained presented symbolic depictions of his immediately preceding thought. Silberer corresponded with Jung and sent him off prints of his articles. In 1912, Ludwig Staudenmeyer, a professor of experimental chemistry, published a work entitled Magic as an Experimental Science. Staudenmeyer had embarked on self-experimentation in 1901, commencing with automatic writing. A series of characters appears, appeared, and he found that he no longer needed to write to conduct dialogues with them. He also induced acoustic and visual hallucinations. The aim of this enterprise was to use his self-experimentation to provide a scientific explanation of magic. He argued that the key to understanding magic lay in the concepts of hallucination and underconsciousness. He then placed particular importance on the role of personification. Thus, we see that Jung's procedure closely resembled a number of historical and contemporary practices with which he was familiar. <laughs>